Thank you, and I'm delighted to join you for the World Government Summit. My name is Eleni Jokas. I'm a correspondent for CNN. Now, the pandemic has tested leaders, decision makers, and humanity at large. It has forced agility, ingenuity, and using a different lens to find solutions to the ever-growing uncertainties. For the African region, the economic fallout has been significant, with the lowest growth rates on record and rising debts. We've seen a crash in commodity prices. Inequalities are more pronounced announced now than ever before. But resilience and adaptability has always defined how Africans face enormous challenges. Over the past year, African countries have put in motion bold policies to counter the pandemic. And today we discuss the waves of change at government level and private sector contribution, lives versus livelihoods, and what will define Africa's next phase in 2021 and beyond. I'm honored to welcome Tony Alumulu, the chairman of Ayers Holdings, the United Bank of Africa, Transcorp, and the founder of the Tony Alumulu Foundation, a friend and an agent of change in Africa. Tony, thank you so very much for joining us today. Um, you know, the last time you and I saw each other was actually this time last year, and it was my last trip before the pandemic struck. We spoke about the prospects for growth on the continent. We spoke about renewable energy and oil, but on the doorstep was the rise of coronavirus cases around the world, and then it hit the continent. Were you prepared for what was to come, and how did you change uh, what you needed to do on the ground? Eleni, good to meet you. No, the pandemic, uh, we didn't prepare for it. However, it's all about nimbleness, you know, agility and swiftness to adaptation. You know, the world we live in has changed totally, and we just saw it happen the last year. We were planning, we had different strategy sessions, all preparing for the great world, the fantastic opportunity we saw ahead of us. We didn't think about this, and now it happened. But we had to quickly adjust to it. And so for me, uh, the world we live in today, uh, some of these are going to keep happening, but we just need to capacitize, prepare ourselves, and have inbuilt nimbleness in what we do so that we can swiftly react to changes. It's good that we have internet, uh, improved internet connectivity. Uh, it's good as a corporation, that, uh, you know, as a group, we had imbibed some of the philosophies and principles and practices that have helped us today to adjust to what has uh, happened in the world. But yes, we were not prepared, but yeah. we have to adapt and adapt and change very quickly. So you, you know, you and I know that African leaders have a dilemma, uh, perhaps more pronounced than what we've seen in other countries. We've grappled with the lives versus livelihoods question. The lockdowns had a devastating impact on those living on the line of poverty. How would you say, and how would you define the way that African leaders responded to the pandemic? I think because it was sudden, I think there was a, a kind of knee-jerk reaction by everyone, not just Afghans, like globally, all over the world. And, uh, and uh, but later, people started realizing that uh, you can't lock down forever, okay? And that we need to balance lives and livelihood. Uh, people were dying. In Nigeria, where I was part of, uh, I see part of a group we call the COVID. We came together, leading Nigerian uh, private sector people to mobilize funds to help support government. Because most governments were not ready for this. And in fact, there was no budget for this uh, to help mobilize. and. Uh, we had to invest so much billions, you know, uh, to help provide food for, for people. But then you can't keep doing this. People are, people are enterprising, you know, hardworking. They want to go out there and feed uh, for themselves, fend for themselves and their families. So we realized, and government fortunately also agreed, that they would need to open up the economy, open the country. And uh, it's no longer about being locked down. It's about living with this pandemic. It's inevitable, you know changing our lifestyles, changing the way we do things to adjust to, to it. And I'm happy uh, things are gradually improving. You know, it's an interesting notion when we say that, you know, the lockdown scenario didn't actually work in so many African countries because we saw the impact it had on vulnerable communities, specifically on the informal sector, which, by the way, is the biggest driver of economic growth on the continent. So if governments don't protect the most vulnerable, if we don't invest in the informal sector that is a force for entrepreneurship on the continent, what are the risks in the next few years? 
You know, I say to people that poverty anywhere is a threat to mankind everywhere. It's a problem, you know, and in Africa, you see poverty firsthand. So entrepreneurship, support for small and middle scale enterprises, in my viewpoint, is one of the ways we can address this issue in a fundamental fashion. Now in Africa, there's a limit to what can be done to transform the economy if we do not invest in electricity, if we don't improve access to electricity. You know, without access to electricity, we cannot digitize our local economies. We cannot digitize our local communities. And this is where most of our people dwell and live in. And also this is significant in terms of the informal sector that drives the African economy. We must power Africa out of poverty. We must invest in uh, electricity. So to me, uh, the pandemic presents an opportunity for us to rethink and reset reprioritize, make sure that we invest in electricity. As a continent, we need to tell ourselves, set a time now. And in fact, Friends of Africa also, you know, the way you declare war on the, on the coronavirus, war on the polio, we need to declare war on poor access to electricity that we have in Africa. Because to me, it is at the center of the fight for poverty alleviation. And poverty and is so critical. Even some people join the lockdown and say, no, to hell with lockdown. I need to feed my family. I need to, to survive. And they ignored it and moved on. So it's an opportunity for Africa in particular to reset uh, and, and set our economy and continent on a path to the so that to a sustainable future, a better future uh, that would um, that, that, that goes with what's happening to the 21st century all over the world. So you um, have been very brave uh, investing and continuing to invest in oil, even during incredible commodity price crashes. And um, I'm talking about your recent oil uh, acquisitions uh, that you concluded in January. Yeah. Um, but the conversations were happening pre-pandemic levels, which means you were looking at a very different oil price environment, a very different demand scenario, and you went ahead with it. This is what I said. She ensued. Eleni, did you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Did I drop uh, out? Yes, yes, yes. Can I do? Did uh, I don't know if okay. Let me let me do that again. Okay. So you were you yeah. So you concluded you concluded an oil deal in January, um, but the negotiations that you started started before the pandemic struck in a very different oil price scenario, very different demand scenario, and yet you saw your acquisitions through. What is required from a leadership perspective to say, look, I'm going to look past this negative cycle, perhaps the worst cycle of our generation, and still believe in what I wanted to do, even before the crisis hit. Yep. <laughs> You're being called brave and a risk taker. <laughs> Eleni, you know, you know, the truth is we are long-term investors. And the philosophy that uh, I propounded, the philosophy of African capitalism is all at the center of this. It's about a call on the African private sector and investors in Africa to think long-term invest in Africa, because that is the only way we can deal with issue of poverty, alleviation, that's the only way we can create massive employment for our people. And that's the only way we can actually power the economy. So for us, and for me in particular as a group, I, we, the pandemic is here, it will go. We need to think long term. We need to think of what will help us deal with the future pandemics that would inevitably occur. And so for us, investment in energy, we're looking at integrated energy strategy for our group. Integrated because you can't do fixed power if power cannot be fixed in isolation. So to us, the $1.1 billion investment we made in January is to help further uh, achieve our vision for a prosperous Africa built on solid access to electricity for everyone. And, and there's a lot of spin-offs that will come from it. You know, if we don't digitize our local communities, we can't even fight this pandemic and we can't fight the future pandemic that will occur in one form or the other. And poverty will continue 
to be with us. So when we make this investment, we make this investment not necessarily because we want to make more money. It comes with it. But more importantly, we think that Africa at a time like this needs massive investment in infrastructure, power in particular, and broadband access to help correct the poverty level we see on the ground. So through this acquisition, you've become one of the largest um, African-owned oil and gas companies, which is incredible because you bought assets from other large multinational companies. Do you think we're going to start seeing the rise of more indigenous companies, more African-owned companies, more African excellence in the next couple of years? What's your prognosis? When we make investment, we try to help catalyze others to also think, begin to think in that light. You know, we do need uh, Africa, for instance, uh, is in that natural resources. But uh, unfortunately, we import almost everything. So we need to begin the process of reversing that so that we can have value, local value creation. And that is where value is actually added locally. And so the investment we have made, and we have welcome and encourage others to make similar investment, the international oil company will acquire this asset from Shell, Total, and the, and the ENI. And we're also happy that they saw reason with all the need for this kind of a massive development to occur on the continent. And so we believe that this is integrated from oil, you know, gas present, gas to power, you know, um, refinery, uh, and so food, petrochemicals and coal. So it's just uh, what we need on the continent. And, you know, for us, we believe that we must, as business leaders in Africa, stand up, show confidence in our, on our continent by investing on the continent, attract investment to the continent, and help through this process to create jobs. Our people need jobs. Our people need role models. Our people need to see that uh, you don't need to migrate out of Africa to, 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 to earn a living or to end the decent life. So for us, through both the business and the Tony El Melu Foundation, we're trying to role model, we're trying to create, uh, to see how through entrepreneurship and support for these teeming young Africans who can help to alleviate poverty. Every year, as you know, we support a thousand young African entrepreneurs, uh, men, women, sector agnostic, all they need to have just to have ideas. And through the Tony El Melu Foundation, we give them $5,000 non-refundable seed capital. We train them. We meant to provide mentors for them, and we created TF Connect, a big uh, digital uh, uh, networking space, place for them to interact with each other. So we think that this is the kind of intervention, especially at a time like this, we need in Africa to pull Africa out of poverty, to create employment for our people, to give hope to young Africans. And this is what we also invite others to do in Africa. You know, I was going to go to that because a few years ago we sat and we spoke about, you know, creating wealth. And you said to me, you know, what's the point of having the privilege of creating wealth? What's the point of having titles, billionaire titles, or, you know, having a certain ranking if you can't give back? And that's when you were telling me about, you know, the incredible investment you're making in entrepreneurs on the continent and just giving money away to budding ideas. I want you to give me a snapshot of the most exciting things you've seen. And importantly, what is the success rate of these entrepreneurs that you've been investing into over the past few years? I mean, is it worth your while just giving money away? You know, Eleni, you call it giving money away. I call it investing in the future of Africa. I got it. But you know what? I mean, you know, literally, you, you've got a business plan. Here it is. You don't have to give it back. I know. But you see, <laughs> as I said earlier, Poverty anywhere is a threat to all of us everywhere. It's a threat to our families, our business. And more importantly, as someone who born, bred, schooled in Africa and who uh, does business in Africa, I know that uh, wealth for one person or a family is not, it does not give security at all. Uh, what gives security is uh, to see that we democratize prosperity around us as much as possible. So if we commit, we commit a hundred million US dollars to this. Uh, yes, it, pinch, it takes a lot, but uh, it seems to me that it's uh, in our self-interest to do so. And more so, when you see, as you said, as about uh, what excites me in all of this experiment or experience, 
is to see these young Africans do well. With your 5,000 likes, I'm always amazed at what I see at Atcom. I'm like, this little body could in the $5,000 help them to prove the idea. Then other investors can come in and begin to invest in their ideas. So it's actually the kind of push they all need. We want to create our future safe jobs out of Africa. I want to create our future biggest out of Africa. I want to make sure that you have more than goddess, more Elumelo, more Patrice Mosefe, more Boa, Samad Boa out of Africa. And it can happen. The journey has begun. All we need to do is one, identify these young Africans who are committed, who are serious, invest in them, provide seed capital, provide mentors for them, make sure we help create a networking platform that provides opportunity for them to talk to each other or one another, and role model. Let them see that in Africa, success can come. But we need our government to also help. We need our government to make sure that they write the enabling environment that these are young Africans need to succeed with their business ideas that are provided. And I'm beginning to see signs of this. You know, not long ago in my country, in Nigeria, we advocated, I had the opportunity of speaking at the platform, and I said to government, you must do something about tax for the small and small and medium scale enterprises. And I'm happy that. Uh, Things have improved in that area. They are not being, the tax regime is favorable to small and medium scale enterprises. This is what we need, but we need electricity. These guys will create, will create future biggest and, uh, and, and, and see jobs out of this community if we have improved access to it. That's why for me, this kind of platform, uh, talking to the world and African leaders and every business person, I say my message is simple. Let's put hands together. We need a new Marshall Plan for Africa. In this case, for me, it should be in the area of improving the access to electricity. Once that is done to a large extent, every other thing falls in place. So if you had money today, as an investor, whoever is listening in, what would you encourage them to do? Is it investing in private equity funds? Is it investing directly in companies? How do we get international cap capital to work for us? Because sometimes we see it as hot money coming through and it just creates volatility because people come in quickly and they leave quickly. What exactly would I do with my money right now wanting to invest in Africa? My, what I do with my money is I invest long-term and what I would encourage other investors to do is to think long-term in Africa. There's nowhere else you get the kind of returns on investment as you get in Africa. It's huge. And most people, what they see is just the risks. But the glass is half full. You see the risks. What is the vehicle? What is the vehicle? Is it markets? Is I'm, it? No, no, you see, for me, it's a combination therapy. You know, we people want to come to the market, you come from, for me, what creates the market in terms of most time short term. What I support is medium to long term. Look for, identify credible local partners, invest in their ideas or invest in their businesses, help them capacitize, help them go to the next phase, stay with them on that journey. At least don't think of like three years exit. I would say five to 10 years, help to capacitize, not just providing capital, help, you know, like governance practices, accounting policy, certain things you need to help them build so that when they achieve success, they stay successful and they can grow more successful. That to me is very critical. What we do in our group, you know, I think the secret of the little achievements that we play is we have certain solid principles that guide what we do. We call it the TOE way, enshrined, strong corporate governance, strong practices. You know, we need our African leaders and business uh, entrepreneurs to begin to imbibe this. And that is why the Tony Elmilu Foundation, to people, they think the $100 million is the biggest thing we've done or we're doing. To us, is that teaching, we teach them for 12 weeks, 12 weeks train, uh, training, teacher, training program and appointing mentors. And that training program teaches them how to run a successful business. For most time, businesses start off well, or poor management leads to early failure. So to us, it's so critical. And investors coming to Africa, I would say time to come is now. African leaders have realized that they have to create a welcoming environment for foreign capital. 
And African private sector leaders have come of age also. I invest in putting their money. Our group, as you said, I learned this uh, not long ago, we invested up for $1 billion in oil and gas. And just in the beginning of January, also, we invested $300 million to acquire another power plant that's about uh, 900, over 900 megawatts. These are things we're doing because we're confident in the local economy. And we're so we're running. We're running out of time, and I want you to give me a snapshot. It is the year 2024. What, what, what are the most exciting sectors that have, you know, the sunrise, sunrise sectors that are driving Africa's economic growth and investors are smiling because they've made the right bet? Infrastructure, access to electricity, and most importantly, digitization of the African economy. We need to just do so. We need the population is huge and not just huge the demography of the population is exciting you have people who are ready who are the young ones and internet uh, digital economy is here to stay so we need to just capacitize that further we need to create massive bandwidth digital infrastructure that will orchestrate and usher this uh, this, this moment and i think those who invest in the digital infrastructure today, those who invest in fiscal infrastructure today, especially improving, trying to improve access to electricity and mass transportation system will reap. And of course, the integrated uh, energy play will reap the future. Yeah, but you, you're a conglomerate guy. You're so diversified. You have the largest uh, listed company in the Nigerian stock exchange. Um, 10 years ago to what I see Tony today, incredible growth. Where's Tony in 10 years' time? And what's the winning formula in making it big in Nigeria, one of the most volatile countries when it comes to currency, you know, there's capital controls, there's so many things that you have to contend with as a, as a, com as a company as large as yours. I mean, people look at Nigeria and go, well, I'm, you know, this is a risky market. So you've made it big. How do you do it? So people see risks. We see opportunities. And then we say, okay, if we see opportunity, let's go for opportunities and see how to mitigate the risks. So if it's a foreign currency, we now have diversified. We're also earning our own foreign currency. Uh, foreign, uh, currency. We, we, we are in sectors that are very critical for the Nigerian and African economy. And if you look at United Bank for Africa that operates in 20 African countries, uh, it's playing a significant role in helping to capacitize and develop economies in this country. When we go to a country, we identify the, the, uh, the, the growing sectors and we support the growing sector. We identify the critical sectors like small and medium scale enterprises, we identify and support them. We know that infrastructure is key for the development of uh, the continent. We support governments in all 20 countries we do business in. In the uh, other business we do in Nigeria, if you look at the way we operate, when oil and gas, when power sector, when hospitality, when healthcare, because we have seen through the pandemic that uh, investment in healthcare is one of the biggest and best investments you can do in life. And so to us, all of these things uh, support our business growth, but more importantly, they identify with what is important to the country and the continent. And the continent. So- Okay, prediction very quickly. How many new billionaires are we going to see in Africa in the next three years? <laughs> You know, Eleni, I think uh, we'll see more billionaires. We can see signs. <laughs> we can see signs that the ones that are there are getting stronger. I am climbing up the, the league table and new ones are coming. But what is important, Eleni, is, you know, we need to begin to move the world away from this so-called billionaire list. What is important is the impact that we make. What do we do with the billions that we have made? So we should be talking of how many young Africans are going to impact in five years' time, in 10 years' time, rather than the number of billionaires we have. Instead of us having a pyramid of few billionaires, I prefer that we all have a large base that has prosperity, happier people, and people whose basic uh, human needs are met. I think that is what will give us the sustainability we need in Africa. I think that's what give us the lasting peace we need in Africa. I think that's what address the security concern we have in Africa. That is what also stop the migration of our young immigration of our young ones from the continent. That will stem extremism. All the kidnapping we hear about every day all around us is because of poverty, is because of hopelessness, is because people don't see a better future. 
we need to reset the mind. We need to begin to think in a better way to improve mankind, humanity, and society. Thank you. Tony, thank you. Thank you so very much for your uh, insights. Thank you for your time. I look forward uh, to uh, seeing all your predictions come to fruition in the next few years. And I uh, hope to see you in person soon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you soon too.